All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Everness Real Estate Investor Podcast. I am your host, Spencer Sutton, and I've got two co-hosts with me. Matthew Whitaker, welcome back. Gray Hall, welcome back to the show. I am so glad to be here and glad to be back on with our, uh, our superstar, Gray Hall. <laughs> Too kind guys, you're too kind. They're just they're just trying to get out of this thing and just push it all on me. But no, this is the highlight of the week. I'm excited to kind of get here and talk about it. It's fun to kind of brainstorm and think through, you know, how can we help investors continue to buy property? So always enjoy getting together to record these. It's the highlight of your week because this generates all your autograph requests. So <laughs> you're just uh, becoming a superstar before our eyes. That's it. You know, walking down the street, it's tough these days. You know, it's just uh, getting stopped left and right. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's kick it off. I mean, Gray, we were talking right before we came on here just about, um, man, we're trying to hire a lot of people. And this is, you know, we don't have commercials, we're not interrupting the show with commercials. So why don't you talk about what we're talking about as far as hiring new people? We've talked about this in, in other podcasts, but um, this thing has just kind of really grown, picked up steam. We've got a lot of investors that we're working with, a lot of first-time investors or people building their portfolio. And we're continuing to look for you know, the best investor-friendly agents in markets. And so you might already be in real estate and have your license and have some experience and want to be in the business kind of full-time or want to work with a lot of you know, investor-focused leads. It's, we've hired a couple of people and they've kind of, were doing retail before. They're passionate about working with investors. They're passionate about investing themselves. And so it was a great fit and kind of that scenario. And they've really enjoyed that. We've also got other people who just are, interested in real estate investing. They might spend their free time listening to other podcasts like this one. Um, and you know, they might be buying properties themselves. Like our goal here is to you know, help investors. The way that we do that is have great agents. And a lot of the things that we're creating is like really good systems to be able to you know, operate and kind of run your business. Really good training. I mean, just kind of getting a bunch of people together who have experience either 15 years of renovating houses or 20 years buying homes, you can soak up and learn from all of these other people. So um, yeah, if you're interested and you're in a market that we're in, or even a market that we're not in, we would love to talk to you about, you know, coming to work with us, what that looks like and coming to join this brokerage team. So, uh, we've got really big ambitious goals. We are continuing to put out content like this. We're continuing to find other investors to work with. And so if you've got any interest, if you want to work in this full time, I mean, there's a lot of people who day job is, is kind of something non-related. And if you could find a way to have a unique advantage and have kind of, you know, insider information, just kind of work in, in the business full time to kind of be ingrained in that, it, it's really a big benefit for you building your own real estate portfolio. And so, yeah, if you've got any interest, please reach out to us. Um, and we would love to, to talk through what that looks like. And I would even say, even if you're not, if sales is not your thing and you don't see yourself being a, an agent, we have plenty of operations roles, operational yeah. roles in the property management business, probably even in brokerage. So we're continuing to expand. I think uh, by the end of this year, we'll have 250 team members. Right now we're about 180, almost 200. So we're, we're hiring for a lot of great positions. You can check those out uh, at our website, evernest.co and uh, see what we're hiring for. All right, let's kick it off. This is, uh, you know, we're, we're excited. Like Grace said, we, we love to help investors. We want to um, provide content that you can use as you are building your portfolio of rental properties, whether you're, you've already got five or maybe you're trying to buy your first one or maybe you have 50. So today we thought we would we'd really kind of hone in on some of the biggest fears that we see uh, that keep investors from buying rental property? Like what are the biggest fears out there? So, you know, and, and really it's their first rental property. I think that's an important yeah. thing to, to like comment on because it's like, once you get over the hump of your first, uh, we call it zero to one. Once you go from zero to one, you realize that it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're willing to buy more and more and more, but it's kind of like that first hump getting over that first hump becomes a really big issue for people. And that's where we see, frankly, a lot of people get stuck. And what we've seen is that once somebody buys one, they generally like the large majority of them buy more. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of proves to you that the fears of the the people that are going, that are scared or, you know, not, not choosing to go from zero to one are, they're not, th th those don't come true because they, 
a huge percentage, I don't know a number, but a huge percentage of the people go from one to more Mm -hmm. when they, uh, when they do decide to buy one. So it's like, they've realized, Oh, it was really like a, like a false fear. And then it's not, you know, there's not anything really to be afraid of. So let's go back to 2004, Matthew, you bought your first rental property. What were the, what were the fears that you had as you, I mean, you were a young guy wanted to start, you know, wanted to get into real estate investing. What were the, what was probably the biggest overarching fear that you were worried about? I think it was actually 2003. Uh, when okay. I bought my first property, October, 2003. Yeah. Look, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I, you know, when you're young and kind of hungry and don't have a lot to lose, I think you probably are less likely to have some of these fears. Uh, you know, I was, uh, one of the things that I can vividly remember is, uh, for those of y'all who haven't listened to some of the first shows, Spencer sold me my first rental property, but I can vividly remember like begging you not to sell me a bad deal so that I got like put out of business Fuck. right off the bat. Yeah. And so like, I remember having this conversation with you and I don't remember exactly what you said, but I remember my end of the conversation was, Hey, please just like don't let's not pr- promise me this isn't a bad deal because I didn't know enough to, uh, to know whether it was a good deal or not. And so at that point I didn't have like any partners or didn't have a relationship with somebody that could say, yes, this is a good deal. And so, um, that was kind of my big fear is like screwing up the first deal. Yeah. Cause you, you were probably very ambitious. So you were thinking down the road, Hey, I want to have multiple rental properties, but if I screw this first one up, like it's a high likelihood that I might not recover and yeah. it's gonna, you know, I, I won't be able to get back. And so, you know, also you and I were introduced through a mutual friend, right? So you were going, a lot of it just had to do with trust, right? So you were trusting yep. your friend and you were trusting that, Hey, he's not going to introduce you to somebody who's probably uh, screw you over, take advantage of you. Yeah. But I, I think like the pair, probably the people that listen to the show, generally speaking, our clients are, uh, very successful in their day jobs. Right. Mm-hmm. And so their fear is not like being put out of business, right? Like they could right. overcome a bad buy. I think there's some fears that are related to looking dumb or, you know, essentially getting started and not being good at something that people have that, especially when you're, let's say you're an attorney or you're a, you're, a, you're a, tech, uh, employee in California. We have a lot of, um, um, a lot of those are clients and and you're like, you're, you're a nine or a 10 out of 10 in that world. And then all of a sudden you're coming to this new world where you're, you're starting out as a one, or maybe you've learned some things and you're a one, two or three. And then all of a sudden it's like, do I really want to jump into this thing and learn something brand new versus, you know, this other thing where I'm just like the expert. And so that, that really becomes a big hurdle to overcome, to be the newbie, to be the rookie coming from being the the salty veteran in your day job. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. I think what this drives people to is another place people get stuck is like, Hey, because I'm afraid of making a mistake or making a bad investment, people typically tend to really lean into, Hey, I want to learn everything that's possible. And that's a really good thing. I mean, like listening to podcasts, reading books, talking to other people's, but then there's still this analysis paralysis is kind of the term where you want to, there's always another piece of content that you can basically, you know, ingest to continue to learn. But what we found, and you know, this has been my experience when you buy that first one, you can only learn by doing, you know, up to a certain point. And so And yeah, sorry, great to interrupt, but I think it's an important point to interject. We actually just had a meeting and the conversation in the meeting was, you know, letting our agents buy some rental homes or buy homes so that they real, so that they also know the process too, right? Like is exact, it kind of proves out the point of what you're saying. Like once you do it, it's not that big of, it, it doesn't become such a, such a big deal. Yeah, because the, the, the fears kind of mount and they become these outsized things where there might be a 5% chance or way, or you just want to learn how to minimize that risk so far. And the reality is once you kind of get in there, you can do a ton of things to kind of protect your downside and still make it a really good investment. That's what we hope to be able to do here is kind of like learn from our experience and buying these properties and helping other investors buy and to manage so that 
you kind of have the information, but also the ability to take action on it. Cause I think that's the other really important component of it is we all tell ourselves these stories and you've got to kind of get over that hump and buy that first deal, even make that first offer. I think you learn a lot, even just making an offer, going through the inspection process. What does that learn? So we can kind of dig into some of these fears specifically and, and speak to our experience, you know, hearing investors have those fears, what the realities of them are. And so I think kind of understanding this and then like leading that to take action and kind of, Hey, what's your next step in this? And so if you've kind of planned, Hey, I want to buy a property at six months. Hey, what's that next step? I mean, there's always going to be another piece of content, but we want people to be action takers and doers. And that's really kind of the only way to learn. And once you do that first one, you say, Hey, these fears were not that bad. This is what you do to mitigate it. This is who you call. This is how you leverage that relationship to make sure that those fears don't become a reality. Yeah. And I would imagine some personalities are going to, it's going to be a lot easier just to pull the trigger and go, and they're going to be somewhat fearless versus other personality types are going to be more analysis. You know, they want to, they want to weigh everything out. Um, I was the former, so I was just pulling <laughs> triggers and, and shooting things. So, all right. So we've got, we wrote like, we, we talked about five of the most common fears that we hear from real estate investors. So why don't we kick it off? Gray, why don't you give us the first one? Yeah. So it's just, I mean, fear of buying at the wrong time. And is the market going to crash? Is this the right time to buy? And that's a, that's a consistent thing that people have talked about over the past 10 years, the great financial crisis. And I mean, I, I think that the reality is nobody has a crystal ball. People who were calling the top in 2019 were massively wrong. And I mean, that, that could be the reality. I think they're just understanding that nobody's, gonna, there's no amount of research that really can predict because, you know, there's kind of a lot of black swan events that, that lead to that. So I think that the kind of tangible takeaway is, are you running your numbers so that the property will cash flow and you have sufficient reserves where it does not matter if the home price drops down? Historically, mm -hmm. rents have not dropped at the same level. The great financial crisis, you know, some markets, you know, corrected 30 to 40%, but rents did not do that. And there's supply and demand factors for that. And so, are you running your numbers with enough cushion and where rents could go down a little bit, but if you've got enough cushion in there and you're buying good properties, it really should not be a fear if you're in this for the long run. Yeah. yeah I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think uh, one, one story I would tell is back in 2014, a big institution walked in our doors here at Evernest and told us they were going to buy hundreds and hundreds of houses and we were going to get to help them do that. And obviously that was exciting for us, but I can remember us having this conversation internally. I can't believe what they're paying for these houses, right? Like we had the, we had call it the scars from 2008, 2009. And these folks are just walking in and pulling the trigger on these houses and paying these, what we thought was exorbitant prices. And, you know, it, it just goes to show you that, that you can't really predict what's going to happen. And, you know, obviously in 2014 was not the top of the market. And those folks continued to buy and buy and buy. And that institution is out there right now. I actually think they sold about two or three years ago, the people that we were dealing with, and they made hundreds of millions of dollars. So, uh, you know, that makes us look kind of uh, dumb to sit there and say they were the ones being wrong. But point being, it, there is no, like, there is no, um, you know, idea. We don't, nobody knows exactly when the peak is or when, when, but you make a great point that as long as the house cash flows, it doesn't matter because generally speaking, real estate is always corrected over time. And if there is some sort of recession, then what'll happen is, um, you know, the, the prices will go down and maybe you have negative equity or just a little bit of equity in the house then. And, but then it'll always come back up. And so I think it's, you know, you can also look at some of the data out there that says, um, you know, we're anywhere from one to 5 million units under what we need to be to rent all the houses to the people that are coming online right now. And there's some, there's some like, some, some data that actually conflicts with that. But point being is right now on the, from the inside, we've never seen as much demand for rental properties in our whole entire career. Right. And we're still renting homes really quickly. And so, um, you know, it, it, and I think Gray made another great point, um, which is rents don't move as fast as home prices. So it is more of a slower thing. And so you can kind of like, plan to correct it as long as you leave yourself enough margin. 
do you see what we're doing gray we're just saying listen to gray gray's got all these great ideas and <laughs> yeah that like pains me to say that gray had all the answers well it's worse when you say i have them so you know the whole I, point though is you're not a day trader right if you want a day trade go look at stocks day trade stocks this is real estate this is a long-term investment this is what you're doing um so you're not you're not necessarily like like we've talked about before we're, we're not getting um we're not basing everything on the market today or whatever this is a long-term play and the it fact is, is, is if i if i had bought all the houses i wanted to in 2017 at the like previous top of the market i would be really uh, 2007 is what i should have said i think i said yeah. 2017 2007 if you know fast forward 15 years i would be really happy today right yeah, and i right. apparently bought at the top of the last market so <laughs> Yeah, look, I, this is kind of pretty clear. I, maybe we beat a dead horse, but Gray, you were, no. I interrupted you. Sorry. I, no, I just think like making sure you can weather the storm. And so like real estate is a, it builds and it's a slow way to build wealth. It's not really a quick thing. And I think that that is, I think you can, if you're flipping or kind of really forcing a lot of equity, but if you're buying long-term buy and hold, so make sure you've got cash reserves, make sure you're in a position where you're not forced to sell because we talk about, Hey, values can go down. Do you have enough, you know, reserves and kind of your personal life or in the property where you're not having to be forced to sell? And so those are the people that kind of made it through. Also, just speaking about market timing, like majority of the last market was these adjustable rate mortgages with a balloon payment after five years. A very small percentage of like fixed rate debt people, meaning 30 year long term. Right. Yeah, you know, that's the majority of the, the, the mortgage is being issued right now. That's way less of a concern. So that mortgage is going to stay the same. We're in an inflationary environment right now. I, yeah, mortgage rates might be in the fives or the sixes, but historically they're still pretty low. So all of those kind of factors are, hey, make sure you can kind of weather the storm. It's, you know, don't be afraid as much of that because it's impossible to time the market. And there's tons of kind of research and, and data out there that shows that. And so it's more time in the market opposed to timing. And so make sure you're in a spot and that it really doesn't matter. And that's how you kind of protect that downside risk of that fear. All right. That's good. Next most common fear, Matthew, what do you, let's talk about this one. We've, we've got a lot of experience with this. What we call that is uh, buying a property in the wrong area. And, and so, um, you know, like one of the things we always talk about is, well, you've heard it before. Real estate is location, 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 and just being like intimately aware of where the location is, I, you know, if for somebody that's just getting into the business, this is, this is a, like a really legitimate fear buying the wrong property or in the wrong area. I think this is why it's very important to have a partner that you can trust that has the mental models. That's like been in an area that's bought a lot of houses in whatever area you decide to buy that can help you, whether that's a broker, whether that's a property manager, uh, whether that's an actual partner, I've heard a lot of people successfully going out. Um, you know, this is kind of my story where I had a lot of time and no money. Uh, I found some partners that had a lot of money and no time. And, uh, you know, they, they needed somebody to essentially go like do, be the doer. And that allowed me to go and uh, understand these areas. And they wanted somebody that understood the area. So finding like a legitimate partner, well, again, that could be somebody third party that you pay to be your partner, or that can be somebody that actually has equity in it. But, but it, I think it is a legitimate, like don't buy the wrong house. I think that's like a legitimate fear, but it's not so complicated that people haven't learned how to not to buy the right, the wrong house. And plenty of people are investing. I mean, that's kind of been the shift over the past five or you know, 10 years is this whole like remote investing, investing in other markets where if you're in a market and you know, you're interested, their numbers kind of look better in another market. So I think the really cool thing for out of state investors is like the technology that has improved. So there are a lot of places that you can look at you know, crime or neighborhood score, these other types of things that you can all kind of do from your computer. So I think pairing that with, Hey, what are the resources out there to understand the, the area? But there's also one street over a house is going to get double the rent just because of school zones or other things like that. So it's kind of pairing like, Hey, do your research on like the, the big level speaking about kind of which area to buy in. And then there's the local of, Hey, buy on the street. Don't buy on the street. These are good pockets. Also people who are local are going to know because they're reading the, the business journal, for example, Hey, what new business is opening here? And so a strategy, a lot of people try to implement is buying in areas of growth. So where are things growing? Where are things getting built? So it's more kind of speculative, but 
if you kind of know somebody in the market. And so it's kind of pairing those two together, probably the two kind of practical ways uh, to do that. If you're not investing in a market that you live in and you can kind of drive in and know those things yourself. I would also say if you're, if you're looking for, you know, C minus D class uh, areas, you got to be very, very careful. I mean, we've seen, we've seen investors buy houses, not, through us, but we've seen it in the past where they bought houses and didn't really even know the street scene, right? So it can go when you're when you're buying in those types of areas, you really even have to know the street. Like you have to understand, is this a good street? Are residents going to want to rent? Like great residents, are they going to want to live here? And so just knowing that, and then I would also say not only buying in the wrong area, but buying the wrong house, right? So you buy a house with a funky layout. We call them white elephant issues. These are issues that you cannot do anything about right so it could be on a super busy street could have railroad tra tracks behind it could be a funky layout that you can't change within the house steep driveways these types of things uh are are you know you really should be careful um and make sure that your house is pretty much as cookie cutter as possible for the area i think it's important though to know that you are going to make mistakes especially as it relates to this, right? Like some of the reasons we can rattle off all these problems with houses is because we've made so many. So that again, is one of the important things to learn off somebody else's wisdom, but also don't be so like uh, perfect and say, Hey, I'm never going to make a mistake and right. everything's going to be perfect. And I think that's probably the wrong mental model to make give you a perfect example. I mean, I, I had been doing this probably, uh, you know, I've almost 20 years now, but about, uh, five years ago, I'd been doing this almost 15 years and we, we, we took on a house from an investor and it was in an area, uh, like a city that was, it's like very clearly a city. And it was in a neighborhood. That's this huge neighborhood in Birmingham. And, um, and it was like in Hoover, uh, which is, um, a city just South of Birmingham. And, um, this whole community went to Hoover, uh, schools uh, at least so we thought. And uh, like what happened was we, we didn't realize it, but literally one half of one side of the street went to county schools, was not in Hoover City. And we rented it to somebody that that mattered to them. Sure. And then, um, you know, got it, got in, you know, so we did screw it up, right? Like, uh, the, the owner obviously thought that they were buying a Hoover school system. In fact, like it, we even checked with the school system before they moved in and the school system said it was in. So it was like, we even checked all the boxes and it didn't work out for these folks. So just know that that's part of it. And, and like, at the end of the day, it's all about making enough good decisions um, that you make money and that'll like counteract the, the very few bad decisions, but also not being so scared of making a bad decision that you make no decision at all. That's right. All right. Gray, number three, what's number three on our list? How do you pay for it? How do you finance it? Um, you know, that can be a intimidating aspect of even just getting under contract. Um, and so I think there's a lot of good content. Uh, I think we've shot some other videos kind of walking through, you know, the different ways to finance it. Um, but that, that can be an intimidating thing. But again, once you kind of go through it one time, you know what to expect, you know what documents they're going to need, you know what interest rates, what leverage you can get on the property. And I mean, this is like a financial leverage, you know, using a loan, but there's also like leverage a mortgage broker and talk to them, give them scenarios of properties. Hey, what would this look like? Get pre-approved for the loan to see what you're you know, available up to. And then ask them, hey, what's the process through it? Or ask your agent, who are the good lenders to talk through? So there's a ton of different ways that you can finance deals. The most traditional is going to be, you know, a Freddie or a Fannie kind of conventional mortgage where you're putting 25% down. There's other ways that you can leverage equity in your home. If you're in a high price market and the market has appreciated, you get what's called a home equity line of credit that you could use for a down payment or you could buy a house in cash. Um, there's private loans, there's hard money loans. So kind of whatever scenario you're in, uh, in a market like we're in right now, capital is, is readily available. And so I think there's plenty of content out there. Don't let that be a, a kind of fear factor for you um, of being able to go through that. There's, you know, talk to your agent. I mean, they've, if they've done deals, they can walk you through kind of the fears and, and walk you through that process and really demystify it because it's a very simple process. They've got to check their boxes. And once you kind of understand the fundamentals, it's really not a complicated process. And yeah, Spencer a, has tons of money. He can just uh, <laughs> lend you the money if uh, give me your yeah. cell phone number, Spencer. <laughs> yeah, I'll put my bank account and, and uh, routing number here. Uh, they can just you know, yeah, suck it right out. 
I spent some time with uh, some friends on Monday, and I was actually talking to one of them. This guy is a local guy, high income earner, very high income earner, and he uh, has a, an investor here in Birmingham that he loans money to to buy houses. <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, all I all I all I get is you know what whatever I think six or seven percent or something like that, whatever his percent was." And he's like, "I'm happy with that money." And so the investor is also very, very happy because he's using his money at a good interest rate to buy these houses and then like paying him back and like refinancing it. So there's several, you, like you can get very creative. However many people are listening this. to this would love to know that guy's name right <laughs> I now. Know, I'm, not, I'm not giving it. I'm not giving it at all. But and I told it, it him, I was like, to, yeah. I mean, it speaks to like talking to people what you, I mean, going to real estate investment meetings at meetups, like other investors have gone through this before. And also talking to people about this, you might have somebody in your circle or, or who they're in that scenario. They've got a lot of capital and they want to return on it. Getting a private funding is kind of like the Holy grail in a lot of people's minds. Cause there's less boxes to check with banks. Um, it's a, a lot simpler process. Like that could help you scale quicker. Cause you also run into this with, you can only have, I think 10 conventional mortgages. So you're even, even if you got success there, you're going to have to get creative and kind of find other ways to be able to finance these properties. But I mean, I think just, yeah, talking, networking with other investors, telling people what you're doing, they might have an off market house that they, you want to buy. They might have access to funding uh, that they're, they're willing to lend out. And so um, a lot of different ways to finance deals these days. That's right. All right, Matthew, number four. Yeah. I, I think like anybody that's listening to this has heard at least one or a hundred uh, problem tenant stories. Uh, we call them residents, but there, there's no doubt that there's a huge fear of like, how do I underwrite an application? Like, how do I know if somebody's telling me the truth? How do I make sure that they don't tear up the house? How do I make sure they pay me the rent? And those are all like legitimate fears because there's a reason there's so many of these stories out there. Um, and, and so like, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to rent to some bad tenants if you do this any any amount of time. In fact, anybody that hasn't rented to a bad tenant has probably not been in this business very long. And so you just need to look again. It's about finding people. I, I think this is one of the, of course, I'm super biased because obviously we have a property management company, but I think this is like job number one. We, we do all of our application underwriting in-house for this very reason, because job number one for a property manager is to get the right resident moved into the home. Now, oh. if I'm a DIY investor, I think there's all sorts of ways you can do it. But let me tell you one thing that I've seen this wrong is it, it's been our experience that you've got to show the house a bunch of times to get it rented. Like what number that is. At one point in our C class, it was like seven or eight times. And what happens is if you're driving from one area of town to another area of town where your rental property, if you're doing it yourself, you kind of like, like you're very like strict on your like underwriting criteria through the first two or three. And then all of a sudden you're like getting tired of driving over there and showing the house. And then before you know it, as long as they can fog a mirror, you are letting them in your house. Right. Yeah. Because you're, you're tired. You're just kind of like, you, you want to believe the story that they're telling you. And then they move into your house. And before you know it, they don't pay. So you got a mortgage I was, to pay like that. I mean, the top clock's ticking. You might've just bought this property right. and that you're that's starting true. to feel that pain, you know, that's that true. could cloud your judgment. Yeah. And, and like, so at the end of the day, it's about like creating underwriting criteria, being objective about it. And then being disciplined enough to show up at that house as many times as it takes one time over in uh an area where we rented a home kind of it was it's it's c class we went to, we showed the house to two prospective residents over a hundred times oh my to goodness. get a to get an approved applicant yep that's I true think the other part of this is like not being able to find a tenant so you've got hey you're gonna have to mortgage to pay when a vacancy is what kills all real estate returns so one way that I've seen people kind of, I guess, how do you overcome that fear? Do not have to like push rents to above market to be able to get it rented. That's going to increase your vacancy. So kind of the tangible action point is really have a good feel for what that market rent is. And, you know, we can tell you in certain areas, hey, that's probably going to get rented in less than 30 days. And you can kind of build that in your vacancy models. But if you're trying to rent a house that should be rented at 1200 at 1400 it doesn't matter how nice the granite is or how nice the cabinets mm -hmm. are. It might take you six months or a year before you find somebody who's willing to pay that. And it also takes a specific tenant. So 
really understanding the market rates when you're underwriting the property to get a really good feel of what the expected vacancy should be. And that fear should be eliminated. Like in this market right now, especially if you're leasing in summer, the demand is there to find a quality tenant if you got it priced right. And to, and to Matthew's point, if you do this long enough, like, listen, it's not all about bad tenants. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, right? So sometimes there are things that happen in people's lives and they're not able to pay the rent. So, you know, you're not going to escape it even with great tenants, but you can mitigate that risk by, by doing a lot of, uh, a lot of the homework yeah. on the front end. Investing's risk. I mean, that, that's oh. at the end of the day is what it is. You're risking capital. And so, even the stock market has risk associated with it and you get a return that's based on the risk. And so what we're talking about here is how do you mitigate all of those mm -hmm. risks, all of those fears to put you in the best possible chance to get a really good return on your money. All right. Last one, Gray. Last one on the list. Yeah. I mean, being afraid of missing a big ticket repair or having a house that continually needs repairs. Like those are two really very valid fears of you know, buying the wrong house or, or missing it. And I'll, I'll kind of speak to what are ways that you can mitigate those risks when you're buying the property, get a home inspection. It is a competitive market right now. I would not advise foregoing a home inspection, especially if you're buying out of state. I mean, to pay, you know, anywhere between 300 to $500, depending on size of the house in the market, having a licensed home inspector who goes through the house and gives you a detailed report of all the big and little items will give you that peace of mind. And it's just not a really wise trade-off for $300, uh, you know, to potentially buy the bad house. I think also too, I mean, one thing we do in a lot of the markets is getting a contractor out there. If it's a home that needs a lot of work, or we're getting quotes on, on kind of big ticket items to understand yeah. what to expect. Um, you're never going to probably catch everything, but inspectors in my experience are pretty good at catching foundation issues, roof, HVAC, the big sewer ones. line. Yeah, yeah, the big ones. And those are the ones that are, you know, the tens of thousands of dollars when they kind of come up. So get a home inspection, you know, process that with your, your agent, get, you know, talk to somebody that's got some experience kind of buying houses in certain areas that might have, you know, even certain areas where you know, majority of the homes built by a certain home and, you know, home builder back in the day, and they might have a common problem. So having that kind of local knowledge oh. and then getting a contractor kind of know what you're dealing with. And those are kind of two ways to mitigate that. You're never going to be a thousand percent. There could be stuff behind the walls, but those put you in the best chance possible to kind of know what house you're buying and to be able to plan for CapEx and maintenance reserves in the future. I mean, the house that we just bought in Jackson, we had some change orders, right? Even on the rehab. Yeah. It wasn't like we missed big repairs, but we still had things that needed to be done in addition to our rehab estimate. Which yeah. I've asked HR to take that out of y'all's compensation <laughs> since y'all missed it. <laughs> Craig? Where's Craig? <laughs> yeah, he's not here for some. We'll follow up later. I, I, so. I, would add, I would add two things. One is just going to build on what uh, Gray said around the home inspection. You know, there's really like the major systems. As long as you get the major systems right, you know, HVAC, roof, foundation, electrical, plumbing, as long as you get those right, like the, the rest of it is not a huge needle, needle mover, right? Like if you miss uh, a crack and that you need to like, um, you know, paint over or whatever, like that's not a huge needle mover. You might lose a couple hundred bucks, but it's, you know, you're not losing tens of thousands of dollars. So to me, it's like step one is make sure when you're buying the house, you get the systems right. The other thing I think is important to talk about here is just the age of the home. Some people call it the vintage now that we're a, we're an industry that has some sophistication, but the age of the home too, I think uh, will dictate how much work needs to be done. And so, you know, having kind of like the money pit home, it's a lot more likely that that happens with a home that's a hundred years old versus a home that's 60 years old or 40 years old, right? Like the newer the home, the less, um, the less like consistent problems you're going to have. And so just being aware of that, I mean, look, I'm not saying don't buy a hundred year old home. I'm just saying, be aware that that's, that one's probably going to have a higher repair and maintenance per month, uh, budget than one that doesn't, you know, the, than one that was built 20 years ago. So, um, again, get your systems right and make sure the age of the home, uh, that you kind of like prepare for it from a budget build, standpoint. build that into your underwriting. Um, I mean, I think the older vintage homes put more in a monthly maintenance reserve yes. that you're kind of withholding from rent. It's, it's funny. I think of this, my brother's buying a house right now and it, it's a new build that he's going to buy as an investment. And so he had a lot of these fears. He called me the other day. I was like, Hey, how much should I reserve for, he was using our, our Evernest property analyzer and 
um, talking through, hey, new build's going to have you know builder warranty in the first year, and then it's going to be lower than if you're buying a 1950s house, which he was looking at. Um, and then also just like, hey, interest rate, hey, interest rate went up, you know, 50 basis points or whatever. And so still kind of selling, hey, the reason that you buy long-term rentals is one leverage, two long-term home prices continue to go up if you're buying in the right areas and buying in the good markets. And three, hey, as long as it cash flows, and what we found is, hey, here's your break-even number um, of, of what it, you need to buy it at. And so I kind of walked through all of this because we're, we're having a lot of these conversations with first-time investors. So these are kind of real fears, but you can mitigate a lot of these. Yeah. And so talking to somebody, you know, reach out to us if you've got some of these similar questions when you're looking through a deal. How Happy to kind of walk through and kind of give our you know, expertise in, in a certain market and kind of walk through because at the end of the day, we don't want these big fears kind of miss you out from like reaching your investing goals. And so we're believers in, you know, single family, small multifamily in the long run. I really think it's a good way to, to slowly build wealth, but to surely build wealth over time. And so kind of mitigating these risks, like running your numbers really um, with, a, with enough margin in there and you will be just fine. Great stuff, guys. And listen, if you're listening and you want to uh, reach out and talk to us, fill out the form on uh, our website. It's everness.co slash real estate partner. That's everness.co slash forward slash real estate partner. We'd love to talk to you. Fill that form out and we'll um, somebody from our team, somebody from Gray's team will reach out to you and talk about uh, getting started in real estate investing. So that's it for today. If you haven't already, leave us a review and we'll be back next week with another episode of the Evernest Real Estate Investor Podcast.